time to take a look at artillery tactics in the Napoleonic Wars. After we cover cavalry and infantry tactics before, it is now time for the third arm. Note in this video we'll look at field artillery and skip siege and fortress artillery. Now to give you a basic idea of the artillery of the time, here's an Austrian six pounder of the Wurst system. This was a horse artillery gun. Yet in total weight it was similar to a regular Austrian six pounder. Sadly I couldn't find that much information for other guns, but this should suffice as a general orientation. So the gun tube weighed 386 kg, yet the carriage was the heaviest with 435 kg. The worst seat had 69 kg, the limber was 183 kg, where a limber is essentially a set of wheels which fit to the gun carriage to aid its movement over a long distance. Then the ammunition amounted for 60 kg and the four gunners around 364 kg. In total almost 1.5 tons at a length of about 5 meters. Yet be aware that the 6 pounder were considered light artillery. Additionally only about 4 men were required to fire a gun, yet in general personnel assigned to a gun ranged from 8 to 20 men. As you can imagine moving those guns required horses. Now theoretically a horse could pull around 1360 kg at a distance of 30 to 40 km per day. But that assumes a hard paved road. The weight dropped to 860 kg on hard unmetalled ground and 500 kg on rough ground. These figures were halved if a rider was carried on the horse back. The goal was that each horse share of the load should be no more than 320 kg. Now to give you a basic idea on how many horses were needed, a British Royal Horse Artillery 6 pounder in 1813 with 5 pieces of 6 pounders and 1 howitzer needed a total of 185 horses and mules, whereas 108 were draft horses for the equipment, 71 riding horses for the personnel and 6 mules for the baggage. While Afghanistan might be the graveyard of empires, but I'm rather sure that Russia is the graveyard of military horses. Anyway, let's look at the gun types. There are basically three types for land warfare, namely cannons or simply guns, howitzers and mortars. The latter two were mostly indirect fire weapons, yet more importantly in open field battles the mortar was usually not used. Mortars were used primarily in siege operations and only rarely in the open field. Note the fourth type would be the carronades, but those were exclusively used by navies. For more information check out my video on naval gunnery. Now the mainstay of the artillery throughout the era and before were cannons. This was in contrast to howitzers, which were relatively new when it came to open field battles and were used mainly for siege warfare before the Seven Years War. Howitzers unlike cannons would be fired indirectly, usually at an angle of 20 to 40 degree, but they also fired on sight, but as a rather relative term as discussed later. They also had a shorter barrel since velocity was less of an issue. Why was this the case? Well unlike most cannons they were used to fire explosive shells called common shell. Not solid shots like the cannons. Now most authors point out that common shell was primarily or exclusively used by howitzers. Yet Dawson notes, in Britain common shell was fired by both howitzers and guns. Whereas Kylie notes, shells were not used in cannon. Yet he also notes on the same page a bit further down, the British came up with a superior fragmentation shell that could be fired from the either howitzer or cannon. Did I ever mention that I like precision? Anyway, this brings us to the next point, namely ammo types. Let's start with the simple one. The primary ammunition in use by all armies was round shot, sometimes referred to as ball. It was a solid cast, spherical iron ball used against fortifications, people and equipment. When the ground was dry and favorable, the effective range of round shot could be doubled by ricochet fire. Round shot was primarily used at long and medium ranges. It had a penetration power that's ideally used at dense formation. Whereas against line formations, it had a limited impact if used against the front and in a straight angle. The next one is the previously mentioned common shell, which was a hollow cast shell filled with a bursting charge. Note that the shells were transported empty and filled before or during the battle. The common shell could be used similar to a round shot, but it could be still a threat and definitely was a psychological threat once it had lost its kinetic energy, since the charge inside could still detonate. Additionally the explosion covered an area 
whereas the round shot would only damage men and material directly in its path. The next ammo type or better ammo types are grape shot and canister. These ammo types basically turn your cannon into a shotgun. Of course one could fill his cannon with a lot of small projectiles directly, but there were two issues with this. First it wore out the barrel and second the projectiles spread out immediately, thus reducing the effective range to a minimum. Yet by the mid 18th century it had been discovered that these problems could be reduced by placing the collections of cast iron balls in a container of some sort. Hence the name canister. Now what is the difference between grape shot and canister? Grape shot consisted of a number of cast iron or lead balls arranged around a central wooden spigot and secured with cloth wrappings and cord. Canister consisted of a thin metal or wooden cylindrical case containing iron balls varying from 50 to 450 gram weight. The case ruptured on impact with the ground, scattering its contents with the effect of a giant shotgun. So grape shot used larger balls, was less sophisticated and worked a bit differently. Generally grape shot and canister were used at close to medium ranges. As such the offensive use was limited. Unlike a round shot, they had little penetrating power. As such in dense formations, most of the first line would be affected. The final ammo type was the spherical case shot or usually called shrapnel shot after its inventor. In simple terms this was basically a shell with a bursting charge that was also filled with projectiles. So a combination of a common shell and a canister round. Upon detonation of the charge the small projectiles would shower the enemy and far more effectively than conventional canister. Its great disadvantage was that it tended to explode prematurely, a fault not fully rectified until after the Napoleonic Wars. Whereas canister shots were limited in range in contrast to ground shots, this was not the case with shrapnel, since the casing held until the charge exploded. As such, shrapnel could also be used offensively. Additionally, the casualties inflicted by shrapnel even at the most extreme range tended to be comparable to canister at medium range. Of course, some of you might be preparing for your own campaign right now. In that case, one important question is, how much ammo was spent during a major battle? Well, Rotenberg has some numbers here. Normally, Napoleonic artillery was provided with between 200 to 300 rounds per gun depending on the caliber. Additional ammunition was carried by divisional and core parks. But in battle, expenditure outstripped supply. At the Battle of Wagram in 1809, where about 160,000 French forces fought against 130,000 Austrian forces, the French artillery with about 500 guns spent 96,000 shots. Meanwhile, at the Battle of Borodino in 1812, where about 120,000 French forces fought against the same number of Russian forces, the French artillery of about 587 guns fired around 91,000 shots. So about 192 and 155 shots on average per gun. Which seems to be below the amount of shots given by Rotenberg in the text. Yet this is the average number and I wouldn't be surprised that guns at certain areas spent far above those numbers. Also note that all these numbers are from Rotenberg's book. Now when it comes to range, the determining factor was effective range. Although a gun was able to project the charge considerably further than other types of artillery, such as a mortar or howitzer, the general consensus was that 1200 yards was the extreme effective range for any type of ordnance in the field. Beyond this range an artilleryman could not make out the target within the naked eye, so aimed fire was impossible. Similarly, the Chevalier Dutel remarked that field artillery should never fire at a range greater than 960 meters, which would equate to modern term of maximum effective range. Yet even that range was to a certain degree even rather theoretical, if you think about aimed fire, since gunpowder at that time produced a considerable amount of smoke. As such, after the first few shots, some guns fired actually blind. Now Northworthy describes an episode where half of the battery advanced under the cover of the smoke of the other half of the battery, and thus being not spotted by the enemy. Similarly, von Brandt wrote of his Vistula Legion infantry on one occasion that the gunpowder smoke when fired literally blanketed the battlefield with varying degrees of density, gunners often fired blind into a distant haze. Now one way of firing increased the overall effectiveness and effective range, although if the proper conditions were met. 
When the ground was dry and favorable, the effective range of round shot could be doubled by ricochet fire. Here you can see the approximate fly path of a ricochet fire and round at low angle as depicted by Dawson. Note that this could also be done with shrapnel and under ideal conditions even with canister. Next, let's look at the basics of artillery organization. The basic tactical element for the artillery was the company, which was made up of 6 to 8 pieces. If losses were heavy enough during a campaign and there were no replacements readily available, gun companies would have fewer pieces. Note that these batteries or companies could contain both cannons and howitzers, whereas the first made up the majority of the artillery pieces. The term company was synonymous with battery, each company normally comprising 6 guns and 2 howitzers in the foot and 4 guns and 2 howitzers in the horse artillery for the French in 1804 to 1814. Which brings us to foot and horse artillery. The issue with artillery was and is that it provides great firepower, but it lacks shock power to throw the enemy out of a position. To put it another way, Napoleon stated that it was imperative that cavalry assaults be supported by artillery, since the horsemen armed exclusively with melee weapons could not generate firepower on their own. Consequently, artillery batteries were attached directly to cavalry divisions. Known as horse artillery, these units had mounted gun crews that enabled them to keep up with the cavalry. As such, foot artillery enhanced firepower for the infantry and horse artillery gave firepower to the cavalry. Additionally, with this arm, the commander in chief was able to occupy speedily any unoccupied and favorable position in front or to the flank of his own lines before the enemy could, by sending in as many cavalry squadrons as the situation dictated, supported by horse artillery. Now let's look at tactics and employment. Generally, for tactical purposes, Field artillery was divided into two main categories, those in direct support of the infantry and those in an artillery reserve. This was also important for one key principle, namely concentration. Napoleon was well known for concentrating his artillery into so-called grand batteries. As he stated, artillery, like other arms, must be collected in a mass if one wishes to attain a decisive result. In order to achieve this, he organized his guard artillery accordingly. This allowed him to concentrate his artillery on the enemy flank during a flank attack or during a frontal attack the grand batteries would weaken the enemy center before the infantry and cavalry assault. One key element of tactical employment was of course positioning. One might assume that placing the artillery higher was the best option. If this was not particularly the case, an elevated position was preferred but there were several aspects to consider. French artillerymen usually chose positions on low hills or other eminences in the terrain with good fields of fire and little or no dead ground to the front and flanks. The howitzers might emplace in dead ground which offered sufficient cover and concealment. You might ask why not hills? Well one issue was gun depression. Generally muskets could be depressed more. Another issue were the slopes of the hills themselves. Ideally it had a straight or gentle slope since both convex and concave slopes led to dead zones that could not be engaged even with proper gun depression as you can see here. Now some of you probably will ask, but what about counter battery fire? Well for this area the answer is mostly no. French artillery doctrine for example was to dispense with counter battery fire and concentrate on the enemy infantry, something the Russians and Prussians learned the hard way. The British though the artillery was less numerous also scorned counter battery fire. It took too long and used up a lot of ammunition. The rule of thumb was that if the enemy artillery was hurting your infantry more than you were hurting theirs, only then would you engage in counter battery fire. Now in general there are many similarities between the French and the enemies when it comes to artillery, yet there was one distinct difference on how artillery was used. During the Napoleonic Wars, therefore, the main difference between the coalition and the French artillery lay not in the quality of gunners or guns, but in the way in which they were used. Napoleon used artillery offensively, whereas the coalition allies used theirs to defend their cavalry and infantry. Generally, artillery before and during the Napoleonic Wars saw a substantial increase in effectiveness. In some cases, this is attributed to the fact that Napoleon himself was an artillery officer. Overall, the Napoleonic Wars were the age of artillery battle. Increasingly, after 1805, artillery organization, employment, and command and control was consistently improved among the major belligerents. The number of guns assigned to the armies also greatly increased. 
and territorial organization at division and corps level increased in efficiency. Yet we should not forget that infantry remained the queen of the battlefield, since cavalry could not be counted upon to break well-led infantry in the defensible position. Artillery, although able to break enemy infantry when sufficiently massed or carefully orchestrated to achieve converging fire, was unable to exploit its own success. Echoing the informed sentiment of the time, General Alex would write in Spectacular Militaire during 1820s, the infantry is the real force of the army and decided the success of battles. Well, this video about artillery and artillery tactics was brought to you by my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. Big thank you here for your support. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.